Welcome to the fifth part of the tutorial for the default game engine, where we are making a platformer game from scratch. In the previous videos we made a pretty nice character controller to which we recently added jumping mechanics and we learned how to debug games in default. It's high time to juice up our platformer with some nice effects. In this video we will be adding particle and sound effects. But before we go into this, I will add a few words to one of the functions we wrote in the previous part for handling collisions with level, where I quickly introduced the compensation functionality, but we found out the normal vector in default, even though it was not written straight in the documentation, is taken from a box to d implementation and is a normalized vector, so you don't need to multiply distance by the length of a normalized vector, because this length should always be 1. Next, if we indeed have a penetration distance larger than zero, we calculate projection and I want to explain it further because it might be confusing at first. This line of code is calculating the extent of a projection of the first vector on the other by using the vmav.project function. This is a scalar value. We simply project the first vector onto the other and take this projector's vector's length in a ratio to the length of the vector on which it is projected. We take this proportion as our extent. The purpose of this extent is to determine how much of the accumulated correction vector of self that correction should be applied to correct the current position of the object that collided with an object and moved slightly inside its collision shape. Let's rename this variable to extent maybe for more clarity as I agree that projection isn't the best name and might suggest dealing with vectors. At first contact with the ground, our accumulated self that correction vector is empty. The second vector is the normal vector but multiplied by the distance of the penetration. That case is simple because projected extent is in this case zero and it could be zero in any case where our accumulated correction vector is perpendicular to the current normal. But imagine if we would accumulate some correction value that would be slightly tilted towards current normal and we could project its length onto our normal vector but extended by distance and we have an extent value. For example, if I have previous corrections in the same direction, if extent is equal to 1, it means that the accumulated correction vector self that correction is entirely aligned with the collision direction. In other words, the correction vector perfectly compensates for the collision already and no additional correction is needed, so we can skip such cases. By applying only a portion of the accumulated correction vector based on the projection value, we avoid overcorrecting the character's position. If we would not check it, we would stack all compensation vectors and therefore move the body of the character too far away, more than we wanted. However, if extent is less than 1, it indicates that the accumulated correction vector is not entirely aligned with the collision normal. In this case, the correction vector needs further adjustment to match the collision direction correctly. After the first contact point, we have no self-correction, so our extent is 0 no matter what. In that case, we need to calculate the compensation vector, a portion of the correction we would like to apply to the character's position to compensate for the penetration. It should be a vector that is aligned with the normal vector of the collision, because in that direction we would like to move our character. But how much? To calculate the length of this vector, which we multiply by our normal vector to get the compensation vector, we get the difference between the distance of the original penetration and our projected onto accumulated a correction extent, multiplied by the original penetration distance. Rest is just to apply the currently calculated portion of the correction, called compensation, and add this compensation to our accumulated self-correction. I wanted you to write this code from scratch, because that way you will learn how to write it not only in default specifically, but in any other game engine by just replacing the collision handling message with something that given engine give you about collision, with normal and distance values, and functions to set and get position of the game objects that are available in all APIs. If you are looking for a more advanced solution in default, I can recommend you Platypus Asset by Bjorn Ritz, one of the creators of default. I use Platypus in my own game and when I wanted to add all sliding functionality to it, I made a PR to update the public library. If you also think about any functionality that can be added here, write about it in a comment or make an issue report directly. Platypus is one of the best platformers extensions for default and it have a lot of mechanics implemented already. Now, if the code is more clear or not, let's add particle effects to make a dust when we are jumping or landing on the ground, very popular in platformer games. 
right click on our assets folder and select new particle effects to create it as a reusable component in our assets. Let's call it simply dust. It will be immediately opened in a special editor view for particle effects. With the space key, you can see a preview of the particle effect in the editor. By clicking space again, you can stop it. In the outline, you see how our effect is constructed. It simply has a single emitter by default right now. Click on it and a whole list of properties will be displayed. There are a lot of them and I don't think it's a good idea to explain all of them one by one now. It's rather worth checking them out on your own to learn how they affect the particles. I think the best way to learn how to make them is to experiment here. Most of them are very self-explanatory and thanks to the preview you can always see how it affects your effect. The documentation is also to assist you here. We can also use common tools in the main view to, for example, rotate our first emitter. This emitter is emitting particles all the time, but we want our effect to emit few particles at once and stop emitting further. So let's change the play mode property to once. In this mode, the preview is playing the effect once, but is replaying the effect again and again. In game, it will be played really only once, when we trigger it. It might look strange that the dust is emitted for one second, so change duration property, for example, to 0.1. This value is in seconds, so the duration of one play of our effect will last 100 milliseconds, which is okay to emit few particles. When you have a property with plus minus field on the side, you can add variation to your effect. For example, when you define it as 0.05, the duration will be random between values 0.05 and 0.15. You can tweak some other properties like spawn rate or initial size of the particles, but for the size, it's good to compare it to our sprite, right? Let's save our particle and assign it in our main collection to our hero game object. Select Add Component File and select our Dust Particle Effects file. Powerful thing is that when you have particle effects selected in the collisions outline, you can still use the space key to toggle the effects preview. We can see that the emitted particles are way too small in comparison to our sprite. For convenience, you can now right click on your Dust Particle Effects tab and select Move to Other Tab pane to split the editor's view to still see the collection with your character and edit your particle effect simultaneously. We can now tweak the value of the initial size property and add some variation. I would leave the initial color to white, so red, green and blue components equal to 1, also opaque, so alpha 1, but you can also tweak those values to make a suitable color for such a dust. Over the lifetime of the particles, some properties can be changed and, for example, color components are such properties. You can modify those values over time charts in the curve editor. Right now the life alpha value chart is presented here because it is descending over time to simulate the slow disappearance of the particles. By clicking the icon next to some other property, for example life blue, its chart will appear in the curve editor and the icon will turn blue. If you will instead only type a value here, it will be using it as a constant value of the lifetime of the particle. That's why there are ones in each, because this is a modifier value that will be used in multiplication to get a final value at a given point. As an example, we can slowly descend the blue component of the color by dragging the end point of the chart, so the remaining red and green mixed will make our particles more yellowish over time. By double-clicking on the line, we can make a point on it that we can drag around and drop to modify the curve so that we will set the start of the descending closer to the end of the life of particles. I would like to make the particle lifetime property a little bit shorter and with some variation. You can notice that default automatically adjusts all the life-related properties and the color is changing accordingly to the current lifetime of each particle. I would also like to increase its initial speed, so that the dust rises a little bit faster. To juice up the effect, we could add modifiers to our emitter. There are four modifiers, acceleration that allows to apply acceleration or deceleration in a given linear direction to all emitted particles, drag that can decrease or increase speed of the particles over time regardless of the direction, radial that can apply acceleration in a radial manner taking as a center its position, and vertex that simply allows to make tornadoes. I think it describes it better than mathematical formula. 
for our dust particles emitter we will add drag and leave its default value because we want the dust particles to slowly stop the movement from the emitting point. We could also add some linear acceleration, rotate it so that it is directed upward. I think it will look nice. Now we can only copy the emitter we created and paste it to duplicate our effect for the right side of the character, but we will rotate it along the y-axis 180 degrees to flip it simply, and we have our effect ready. Now get to our script and in a place where we are handling inputs and we perform a jump, add line with a call to function from particle effects API called play, with the first parameter being the address of our dust particle effects. If lost, you can always check its ID in the main collection, and if we are referring to the components of the same game object, it's enough to use relative addressing, so only add a hash sign to note it is a component's ID. Details about addressings are explained in my other video. If we want to trigger the same dust particle effect when we land, the best way to do it is to track previous ground contact in a self table, initialize it to false at the beginning and in our update function apply it to the value of the current self.groundContact variable before resetting it. Now in our function for handling collisions, when you are detecting ground contact and previous ground contact was false, then we can also play our particle effects. That's a lot of dust on our level. And now, in the very same places where we triggered our particle effects, we will play proper sound, but first let's add them. I created a new folder in our assets directory called sounds, and I downloaded packs digital audio and impact sounds from Kenny. I selected sounds footstep grass 000 from impacts and face jump 1 from digital audio and imported it to default by simply dragging them in the sounds folder. Now right click on our assets folder and select new sound to create the sound component for our jump. The editor in this case is just a duplication of the properties pane as there is not much to set in the sound component. You choose the source of the sound and define if it is looping or not and if looping, how many times. You can also assign it to a different group, which is useful if you have groups for background music, UI sounds and in-game sound effects, so you can allow users to set gain for each group separately. In our simple case, the master group is enough. Gain property allows to specify how loud the sounds should be and it is a normalized value. Pan and speed properties allow you to modify the sound pan to set from which side the sound is playing, where minus 1 is corresponding to 45 degrees to the left speaker and 1 is 45 degrees to the right speaker. When it comes to speed, 1 is a normal speed and you can either slow it down or increase the speed. Obviously, for our jump sound we don't need any modification as default value suits our needs already. Such a component can be now added to our hero game object in the main collection and we can trigger it when we are jumping in our script with a function from sound API called play and as a first argument add this component's address so simply hash jump. You can test it and we should hear a sound when jumping. You can now for a practice add one another sound component for when we land on the ground, this time with our impact sound. Add it to our hero game object and play it in our script in the place where we just triggered our particle effects for such an occasion. With this knowledge you can juice up pretty much all games. I think it's high time to make the camera follow our characters so you know what we will be doing in the next part. Thank you so much for all the comments and your support and special shout out to my sponsors and supporters. Check out the links below the video if you would like to see your name here next time. And see you soon!